All right, problem 29, we have the question asking for the graph of which of the following functions that has exactly one horizontal asymptote and no vertical asymptote. Um, so let's first just recall what we're talking about when we're dealing with asymptotes. Remember, an asymptote is, a, is basically a, a, a theoretical line that the function gets infinitely close to as you know as the values you know get very very large or very small so the horizontal asymptote would be you know we want to see what's going on when you take the limit as x goes to infinity and the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the function f of x if we can find um two different values that a function um, approaches as it goes to infinity and negative infinity, then, you know, that's not going to be our answer. We want to find the function that has only one value that's approaching when x goes to infinity or negative infinity. Now, no vertical asymptotes means that you're not going to have any undefined values, in, usually in, in the denominator. So you want to set the denominator equal to zero and see if there are any x values in the domain that um, that'll be, that you'll be able to you know, find a solution for. So let's go through these one by one, because it's not really like a quick strategy that I can tell you. It's more like an analysis and want to make sure you understand these so that you can apply it to like similar problems down the road. OK, so the first function, um, this one, We have no, let's, let's first look at no vertical asymptotes. So we set x squared plus one equal to zero. And we're essentially gonna not have an answer because you can't square a positive or a negative number and get negative one. So this is a, this could be possible because you know there's no solution for the denominator to be zero. So then there's no vertical asymptotes. Now for B, we have x cubed plus one equal to zero. We're going to look for because that's in the denominator. And for this one, you can actually find a solution because um, you can take a negative number or you take negative one and you could square it with negative one. Negative or not, negative one cubed will be negative one. So then this is not going to be a possible answer because there's going to be an asymptote or an undefined value or something going on there. So B won't be an answer. C. We want to set again the denominator e to the e to the x minus one equal to zero. See if we can find a solution. So e to the x equals one, and yeah, we could have a possible solution at x equals zero because e to the zero equals one. Then c can't be an answer because there's an asymptote there. Now for d, d we have e to the x plus one equal to zero. E to the x equals negative one. This you can't have a solution because there's no number you can raise e to to get a negative number. So D could be a possible solution as well. So now we're down to A and D. Okay, so now we need to see the limits for the, in other words, think of, if you remember like maybe in pre call it's called N behavior. We want to see what's going on with the function as it gets very, very large, very, very small. Now this part is a, uh, I honestly am not sure how they um, want you to go about this problem because it kind of takes, I feel it took me like at least five minutes to go through a problem on my own so just to check everything. So I'm not really sure. Maybe they just want you to memorize these functions to kind of just have an idea what they look like. These are usually hyperbolic functions. So these are um, something that's really not covering calculus. So I don't really, I, I mean, I don't expect my students to have an idea of what this would look like or what this would look like. Um, I do obviously because I've been doing this for you know hundred years. But um, um, what you can do is basically study the derivatives or just plug in very very large numbers and get an idea of what's going on. Anyway, so let's see what what happens with the first function when you when you go to infinity. You're gonna have one. You're gonna have one over infinity, right? And you're gonna have essentially zero because any a large number squared will be infinity. Like one over any very large number will be zero, essentially. Now, if you take the, um, the limit as x goes to negative infinity, you're again going to have a positive number there. So you'll still have 
uh, I would say you would still have the the same horizontal azimuth of zero in both directions. Now let's look a little more into this so you can make sure that you understand why it can't be D. Now for D, let's say if you take took the limits as F goes, you know, as, as X goes to infinity, you would have one over E to the infinity plus one. You would have one over infinity, you would have zero as well. So you have zero for this one too, but now let's look at as x goes to negative infinity. You'd have one over e to the negative infinity plus one is equal to. Now see what happens with e to the net to a very, very large number number, to a very, very large negative number. Let me put it over here. If I have e to like let's say negative 100, let's say negative like 10,000. This will be, you know, I don't expect you to do this in your head, but this is equivalent to one over e to the 10,000, right? So then um, what's going on here is that you get a very, very large number in the denominator one over like infinity. So what you get is essentially zero for this first part. This first part goes to zero. So what happens is you get one over zero plus one, and so you get one. And so this one has two asymptotes, zero and one. Um, and this function would actually look something, it actually looks something like that. Um, so the D does something like this, and like those. So it has a horizontal asymptote to the left, y equals one, and then a another uh, and a horizontal asymptote to the right at y equals zero. The graph does this thing. And you could and you could actually go further and investigate this by taking the derivative and second derivative and all that if you wanted to. But I, again, I don't expect you to use that much time on this problem. I'm gonna assume that this is the best way to do to solve this. Um, same thing with A. You could go ahead and analyze this by taking the derivatives, first derivatives, to look at the concavity. But in either case, let me just draw a quick sketch of it in case you're curious. It's not necessary. It's going to look something like this. It's going to, it's going to basically go, it's going to have a peak over here at one, at zero, one, but then it's going to go downwards towards zero in both directions. The answer will be A. All right, last one. All right, for a certain continuous function f, the right ring sum approximation of the integral from zero to two f of x dx and sub intervals of equal length is two times n plus one times three n plus one plus two, of type two times n plus one times three n plus two all over n squared for all n. What is the value of the integral from zero to two of f of x dx? Now, what I found interesting is that um, this is actually one of the lowest scoring problems on this exam. I think it was maybe the third, le the third um, least correctly answered. It's like 20 or 20 or 21% or something like that answer this problem. And I know it's because usually series or sequences or even sums, they, they scare a lot of students, but this is actually not that complicated. You just have to remember that the integral is essentially a Riemann sum as n goes to infinity. Remember, um, again, in calculus, when you first learn about integrals, when you're trying to figure out the area under some function, let's say you're trying to figure out you know, the area from here to here. Right? The, the, the theory, or like the, the, uh, the concept, or the idea that the, the mathematician came up with is basically they want to make a bunch of infinitely thin rectangles, find the area of those infinitely thin rectangles and add them all up, and you're going to get the total area underneath the curve. The more The more rectangles, the more precise. And again, mathematically, you want to get an infinite amount of them so that they're, they're basically rectangles of no width. Anyways, you would want to take this um, 
expression and evaluate it as n goes to infinity. So let's first um, multiply it out. This will be 2 times 3n squared plus 2n plus 3n so plus 5n plus 2 all over n squared will be 2, 6, 6, 6n squared plus 10n plus 4 all over n squared. So essentially, you want to take the limit as n goes to infinity. And this is kind of like maybe one of the strategies you learn in pre-calculus. But you want to just see essentially what, what happens when um, you plug in a very, very large number into n, like what, what dominates it. So um, what you're going to see is that and again, you can, there's different ways that's, that you may have learned how to go about this. Um, the common way that my students will usually learn this is just to divide by the highest powered polynomial that um, that's in the expression. So I would divide everything by n squared. So I would have like 6n squared over n squared plus 10n over n squared plus 4 over n squared divided by n squared over n squared. And this essentially becomes 6 plus 10 over n plus, I think, I'm just going to write this over here because it's not in the way. And that's 6 plus a 10 over n plus a 4 over n squared all over 1. And remember, I'm taking the limit as n goes to infinity. So when you plug a very, very big number in for n, like let's say a billion, 10 over a billion essentially becomes zero. That's like zero. Four over a billion squared becomes zero as well. So what happens is this whole thing just approaches six over one. And that's going to be your answer. The answer is just going to be six. And it's that simple. So don't, don't, um, don't get too scared or intimidated by this. It's just as simple as this concept. So there you go.